Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is Michelle Carter from the Aram Public Library. And tonight we have part two of Monarch Magic with Teresa DeWitt. We're going to learn all about the journey of the magical monarchs from egg to adult. And welcome, Teresa, once again. And if you guys have any questions, please post them in the comments. And Teresa will answer your questions at the end. Thank you for joining us and take it away, Teresa. Thanks, Michelle, and welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna show you how I raise monarchs from egg to butterfly. And so I am just going to switch over. Uh-oh, Michelle, I might need your help here. Stop share. I want to stop my video and just share some pictures here. So hold on while I get it figured out. I'll get there. We see your screen. Yep. Okay, there we go. All right, so tonight is just going to be show and tell. There's lots of information out there. So I'm just going to show you pictures that I have taken and tell you how I do it. Uh, because everybody does it a little bit differently. And um, so this is this is what I have learned. Now, I just want to be honest here. There is a great debate whether or not it's really helpful to collect monarch eggs, raise the caterpillars, and release the butterflies. Um, because butterflies, the monarchs have a place in the food chain. And so when you're taking an egg or a caterpillar out of nature, and bringing it into an enclosure to raise, you are removing it from the food chain. So the argument could be that then some other animal is not getting food. Uh, but I feel like when the population is endangered, I'm gonna do everything I can to help the monarchs. And in addition, um, I think scientists do say that it is, not problematic for people to bring in a few eggs every year, especially because it creates a passion for nature. You learn about the monarchs and their importance. And so for right now, this is what I'm doing. If the research ever says, definitely don't do it, I would stop. Um, but right now I'm learning so much and I'm, I, I'm enjoying the journey. Uh, and I like to think that I'm helping. So this is what I'm doing. I have four, <laughs> I'm new to raising milkweed. I have four milkweed plants in my yard. This is two of them. And I'm wondering if you can spot the egg on this milkweed plant. It is right here. That's an egg. And so a female monarch lays 300 to 500 eggs in her two to six week lifespan. It is estimated that only one to 3% of those eggs make it to become a butterfly. And how can that even be? Because I thought that monarch caterpillars and butterflies were poisonous, so nothing would eat them, but that is not true. There are flies. I personally have seen ants eat monarch eggs. Um, so there's flies, there are wasps, this little white spot right here, you might have mistaken as um, egg, that's actually a hole in the leaf, there was probably a caterpillar there, and a wasp came in and nailed the, and, and got the caterpillar, and left that hole behind. So there's lots of predators, parasites, disease in nature. And then there's also, you know, the problems created by humans. Cars are a predator, pesticides, um, destruction of habitat. So right now I feel like I wanna do everything I can to help these guys out. By my basement door that I come in and out of, I've got a milkweed plant, one. And I don't know how I saw this, but uh, I was coming in the house and I just happened to look over and the light was hitting it just right. And I saw this egg on this milkweed plant. And usually, I'll go back. Usually this is where you find the eggs, either on the bottom side of the leaves. But this monarch mama, she really wanted to make sure that egg was gonna be safe. She, that's like right up next to the main stalk on a little tiny beginning of a leaf. And it was really protected in there. 
I will say that um, I left it there for a couple of days. And uh, right about that time, I saw the ants eating eggs. And so then I couldn't leave it alone. I went out and collected that, that egg. So when I collect the eggs, I never touch them. I have never touched an egg or a caterpillar because your hands have germs and stuff on them. So I never touch them. When I am collecting eggs, I will break the leaf off of the plant. And then I put it in my fancy nursery, which you can see is a glass baking dish covered with saran wrap. And there's holes poked in that saran wrap. Um, and I pick glass just because it's easy to sanitize at the end of the season or in between uses, everything gets cleaned with bleach water um, and, and glass is, is easy to clean. Uh, and then I will put them in, after they hatch, I generally put them in nursery phase two, these little terrariums that I, I got. I replaced glass. I took the glass sides out and put screen in there. So there's good ventilation and airflow. And you can see I have stalks of milkweed plants in glass jars. And so I just keep them in there when they're, when they're teeny tiny. It's just easier for me to keep track of everybody if they are in containers like this. And then as they grow, once they get to where they're very easy to see with the naked eye, I move them over into these mesh habitats. And these are what everybody recommends. All the, all the um, butterfly groups recommend using these kind of mesh enclosures. And they're very handy and they have good airflow. They're easy to, to work with and they create a better environment for the butterflies and the caterpillars to, to grow in. Now, I will say that at the beginning of the summer, I was raising a few caterpillars in my kitchen. And for a lot of reasons, that was not a good idea. So I moved my whole operation down to the basement. Um, when I was raising in my kitchen, it was great because the caterpillars were right there, but so were the cats and the dogs and the flea and tick meds. And flea and tick meds are pesticides, they're growth inhibitors, and that had disastrous results for my caterpillars. So um, the basement it is, and things went much better once, once they were secluded downstairs. All this went great until I read uh, research saying that it was better to raise caterpillars outside. The reason for that is we do not know what information the butterflies need or the caterpillars and butterflies need to migrate. It's a mystery. Right now we're guessing that it is based, they get those cues from the environment, from the angle of the sun in the sky to the length of day to temperatures. Um, it could be the mag some of the magnetic pull of the earth. And so that makes sense to me. And if you're raising caterpillars indoors, they're not necessarily getting those cues. Even though I have them in front of a window, they're still not getting the full exposure to all those cues. And my overriding goal in all of this is to do what is best for the monarchs. I want them to be better off because I'm in their life, not worse. So that research made sense to me. And this is next level nagging people that I got this done. My husband built this for me with boards that he just had in his shop. And everything right now is adjustable because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted other than I knew it needed to be outside. And as you can see from this picture, things went really well, have gone really well in this outside enclosure. Can you spot all the chrysalises, chrysalids in this shot? There's one here. There's one on this leaf back here, over here, here, and then there's one up here. This is the first time I ever had caterpillars form their chrysalises on leaves. They've always done it on the, on the top of the enclosure. Uh, so this was a new experience for me, but everybody seemed very happy. And all of these, all of these butterflies or all of these chrysalids have since become butterflies and are on their way to Mexico. I hope they're in Texas by now. Um, but this outside enclosure is not perfect, and this is going to be something I'm going to have to figure out for next year. Um, they are, if the neighbor sprays their yard, they're going to be susceptible. If the wind is from the right direction, that spray is going to be able to get in and cause problems in that enclosure. Weather, I'm not worried about in the summertime the weather, but like this fall when it's cold and rainy and windy, there's out there in it. In it. So I have a shower curtain that I put over this. Um, but so far, so good. 
and I'll be using it again next year. So I got a Bluetooth microscope. I did not even know such a thing existed, but it connects to my phone with Bluetooth. And the day I got it, I was just trying to figure it out, make, seeing if I could <laughs> make it work for me or not. And I happened to have a monarch egg. And so I focused in on it. And as I was looking at that egg, I could see movement inside. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope that is actually a monarch caterpillar and not a parasite that had got into the egg. And it actually was a caterpillar. And you can see the hole in the side of the egg. He chewed his way out of that egg. And then the caterpillars generally, when they come out, they turn around and then they eat that eggshell. There's nutrients in there for them. So they eat that, nothing's wasted. And look at this guy, isn't he so cute? He even has little baby hairs on him. And then I also got a macro lens and the macro lens is my absolute favorite gadget. It clips right onto my phone camera. And so I can just have it in my pocket whenever I'm um, working with the caterpillars and I can get lots of good pictures that way. It really gives me a sneak peek into their lives and I'm not sure they always appreciate that. Um, so remember last week I talked about how caterpillars have an exoskeleton and they have to molt. And so I got some pictures of them molting. This one, look at, he, he literally crawled out of his skin. And then generally what happens is, again, they turn around and they eat that skin because there is, there are nutrients in the skin for them. So again, nothing wasted. And this picture, I didn't notice it until I brought it up on the screen. There's his face cap. So even the front of his face uh, comes off when they molt. Molting is a hard, hard work. You can tell he's pretty exhausted. It's like he's taking a rest before he eats, before he eats uh, that skin. Sometimes it takes up to two days. And then once they're done and they've rested, it is nonstop eating. So I included these pictures because I think they illustrate how, you know, we may look at them and think they're just a bug. They're just, that's just a caterpillar. It's just a butterfly. But really, the thing that I have discovered is, yeah, they may just be a caterpillar, but each one, had, they're their own caterpillar. They each have their own little personality, their own little quirks. Um, from, and maybe where, where, how they eat, because some of them eat like down the spine of the leaf and up the other side. Some might just eat, you know, a little bit out of the corner. This guy, all, he loved the buds, the milkweed buds, if I brought a stem in with buds. So I always made sure to have one in the enclosure for him. Um, and even the coloring, the, the pattern of the stripes or the sizes of the stripes, the shapes of the stripes, all there, they differ from caterpillar to caterpillar. And then look at this guy, the pattern he chewed the leaf in was a heart. I'm sure he meant to say that, I, that he loves me. And of course I said, I love you too. Uh, just some more interesting pictures of differences in caterpillars. Look at these filaments. Filaments for miles, baby. I bet those filaments were almost as long as his body. Those are the longest ones I'd ever seen. And then it seems like in every group of caterpillars that I have, there's always two. One time I had three that always had to be together. And I don't know if it is that they're BFFs or if it's like a sibling rivalry, I don't want that one to get something that I don't have. But these two always had to be on this leaf. And look at, there are other leaves in there, but they had to be on the same one and they would, they're even eating the stem and they would eat that stem all the way down, both hanging on that stem. Um, but, and again, you can see the differences in their coloration. This one has the thicker black stripes um, so each one's a little bit different, um, and I just really enjoy getting to know each little caterpillar. It is work. It's not all fun and games, people, because those caterpillars eat. So I got some pictures of me in the milkweed patch. This is from earlier in the summer. And when I say it's not all fun and games, I mean it because in this milkweed patch, there are bugs like I never, that I never even knew existed. There are spiders, a huge variety of spiders that I have come nose to nose with. 
There are ticks, uh, snakes, and I don't know what else is in, those, in, in this ditch. Um, on the flip side, I have met a lot of my neighbors. A lot of people stop and ask if I'm okay. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just a crazy caterpillar lady. And I've had a lot of conversations about uh, monarchs and the importance of milkweed. And I've gotten to know quite a few people who live up and down my road from my time in the ditch. So I just wanted to include that, that, that there's, there is work involved. And I'm always, always out in that milkweed patch because these guys eat, they are voracious eaters. And I don't know, you can see, I had a lot in, in this enclosure at one time. Um, things got a little crazy this summer. I had a hard time saying no to any caterpillar. So, so I was in the milkweed patch a lot. So anyway, this was in the morning and I, it's very important to keep the enclosures clean. And so, you know, sometimes when they're at this, at this size, I'm cleaning the enclosure probably twice a day, sometimes more if, if, if I want to get some pictures or whatnot. Um, but anyway, fresh stems of milkweed, you can see the jars that I keep them in. This makes, it makes the milkweed last longer and stay fresher for them. Uh, so they are all nice and clean, lots to eat. And this is eight hours later. Look at how they have stripped down those plants. And then all of these, all the, these dots down here, that's caterpillar poop. And caterpillar poop is called frass. F-R-A-S-S, -S, frass. And let me tell you, frass happens. That is all <laughs> from just uh, probably a 12 hour period. Um, it comes in one, it goes in one end and out the other. And I can post a picture of a caterpillar pooping, believe it or not, I did get a video of that. So, you know, I'd be, uh, clean this out and I just throw the frass out in my flowers. You know, it's, it's fertilizer. And then I included this picture so you could see the silk pad that the caterpillar makes. He spun that from the mouth area. I'm not exactly sure where the silk comes out, but it's from the mouth area somewhere. And then they turn around and they hook their hind legs in there. And look at this caterpillar is just fat and sassy, ready to become a chrysalis. And this was the hot spot in the outdoor enclosure they all seem to like this spot to make their chrysalis in. And every time I look at this picture, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna have to tell, I'm gonna have to make a felt story for my preschool classes that I visit because I always think five little chrysalids all in a row, one will soon be a butterfly and off she will go. And this darker color means that that, that butterfly is gonna be emerging. I would say the next day, probably that butterfly came out. So anyway, that's a children's story waiting to happen right there. These are pictures of what it looks like when the butterfly encloses. You can see the crack, it cracks open, they come out head first and somehow, it always makes me nervous when I watch it, but somehow they always manage to grab onto that chrysalis with their legs and then they hang down and you can see how full that body is, it's full of fluid and almost immediately you can see the body pumping to fill up their wings. And so after about 20 minutes, the wings look like this. And this is something I learned this, this year because of my handy dandy macro lens, I was able to see up close inside the chrysalis, this is their proboscis. And this is like a straw that they slurp the nectar from the, the flowers with. But inside the chrysalis, the proboscis is split for however it, it's made inside that chrysalis. And so when the butterfly encloses, not only are they pumping up their wings, but they are fusing together those two sides of the pro proboscis uh, so that it will work. So if it fails to fuse, then the butterfly has no way to eat. So you always, you always wanna have a fused proboscis. We call it zipping. You want to zip the proboscis. Okay, so these are all pictures of butterflies that I have raised from egg and released as a butterfly. And I often get asked, how do you tell a male from a female? So I included these, these images. Um, a male has thinner veins on the wings, and then they have these black spots. 
and a female has thicker veins and no black spot. So let's take a second here and let's look at this picture. Do you have a guess? Is this a male or a female? No black dot. So that is a female. And this one, pretty easy peasy to tell, isn't it? That's a male, it's got the two black dots. And over here, what do we have? You got it, that's a female. And then I wanted to make sure, did you notice the bonus butterflies in this photo? Um, I think it's fascinating. I always think, how can a butterfly have camouflage, have, especially a monarch? But when those wings are closed, they really do blend in with their surroundings, much more than you would expect. These are more butterflies that I've released. This one I especially love, not only is the lighting gorgeous, but this one I talked to it and it turned and looked at me. And I have read that researchers do believe that the butterfly remembers from, from when it was a caterpillar, which is absolutely fascinating because in the chrysalis, they're essentially becoming goo and recreating themselves into a butterfly. And the fact that they can remember from when they were a caterpillar is fascinating. Um, I don't, I want to believe it. And I would, I would argue my anecdotal evidence is that it is true. I feel like not all of them, but I feel like several of them have definitely recognized my voice. And some of them also seem not afraid of me, like, like they know me, not all of them again. And I prefer, well, I like for them to act like they remember me and let me take pictures of them. Um, but I'm equally happy if they just want to get going because that's what they need to do. And this picture I included just because I think it really highlights those amazing, the amazing coloring on a monarch. I love, love these white dots in this picture. And this is a butterfly milkweed. And those orange blooms were extraordinary this year. And this is, these are three that I released uh, maybe two weeks ago. My snowball hydrangeas are typically white, but at this time in the year, they're that lime green. And uh, I just thought that the butterflies looked really pretty on that. And this is generally, they will hang out on wherever I put them. They usually kind of hang out for a little while to kind of get their bearings. You can see them testing their wings, getting their bearings, and then they fly off. And this lady, I was going to ask you to identify, but yeah, I, I let the cat out of the bag. It's a female, no black dots. Um, it was a beautiful sunny morning and I thought for sure she would just take off, but she was not in a hurry, which means I grab my macro lens and I get up close and personal. And so I got some great pictures, or I, at least I think they're great pictures of her face. And look at how they are furry and look at these eyelashes and her great big eyes. And I love this fur right here. And then her probis proboscis, all zipped up and ready to go. And I do think the fall lighting is extra flattering to the monarchs. So I, this is one that also was released, uh, I believe last week I released this one. I believe this one's a female too. Um, I, my goal, I would love to get a photo or a video of the monarch when they are flying and the blue sky is in the background and the sun is shining on them and making it look like they're glowing. And I've had it have, I've had the opportunity a couple times. And when I, whenever it's happened, it's so beautiful. I just stand there and watch it and I forget to take a picture. So that's the goal for the coming for next year to try to get a, a shot like that. So anyway, this is this is what I've done all summer. After the the butterfly comes out of the chrysalis, I usually within four hours, definitely within 24 hours, um, I have them outside and ready to go. And that concludes my presentation for tonight. Um, so if you have any questions, I am I'm here to answer them. Oh, that was fabulous, Teresa. Thank you. And I have to say that when you were talking about the butterflies eating the milkweed, it reminded me of the summertime and when everybody's eating their corn on the cob. 
how do you eat your corn on the cob? Is it like a typewriter or is it, <laughs> you know, big chunks at a time? That and is I, exactly what it's like. <laughs> yeah, and I loved the pictures of the molting process. I don't think I, I don't think I actually have ever thought about how butterflies shedded their skin and grew. So it's sort of like a snake as they get bigger, they're molting into that, the, uh, the bigger, the bigger caterpillar. Right. Right. right? Yes. Yep. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I really love the pictures. So thank you for sharing them with us, Teresa. And we will be monitoring Facebook through the week. So if you have questions, don't be shy. Um, Teresa will get to you through the week. And we have one more final episode of Monarch Magic this time next Wednesday. And um, next Wednesday will be all about helping the monarch. And as you know from the first episode, Teresa says we have to pay, we have to plant one billion acres of milkweed. And uh, my kid and I are starting on the pollinator garden this year we started. So we'll learn all about that next week. So thank you everyone and uh, have a good healthy week and we'll see you we'll see you next Wednesday.